public lecture. My name is Arne Westad. I'm in the International History Department and co-director of LSE Ideas, the new LSE Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy. And it is a great pleasure for me today to introduce Professor David Reynolds, um, a close colleague, old friend of mine, um, who teaches um, in Cambridge. He's a fellow at Christ College and professor of international history within that university. Now, the topic for the lecture this evening, um, Obama and the Empire of Liberty, uh, it's hard to think of something that would be more timely. Um, if there is something that the new president needs to be aware of, it is the full span of American history. Um, in many ways, President Obama has come to represent that, I think more than any uh, president in living memory has. He is a product of American history for good and for bad. He is someone who sees himself as standing in many different lines of development within American history. Uh, he projected that during the election campaign. He projected it in his inaugural, and I think he has done a lot to project that as president um, since he took over. He could do much worse than having joined us here tonight in terms of understanding the background for the empire of liberty that he is now set to direct over the next four or possibly eight years. Professor Reynolds has written an outstanding book, um, A Survey of American History, Saint Paris. Um, it is a book, I just finished reading it, um, it is a book that really, as the blurb says from the uh, from Penguin, who, who published it, uh, really does provide essential background um, for understanding where the United States is today. And what really impressed me in the book, David, was how you were able to draw together these different lines, conflicting lines very often, in American history, not just in terms of its political history, but also its broader history, economic, social, and cultural history. Um, and to do that within a volume that is not just well presented, but also exceptionally well written. So the book, which I would highly recommend, is a real tour de force. And of course, David is very well prepared to, to write this. He's been writing on US history, on Anglo-American relations, on international history for a very long time. Um, incredibly productive scholar. Uh, I just want to mention very briefly some of his books over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, his overview of international history since 1945 one World Divisible, published in 2000, which I think is the best survey of post-war international history in existence. Um, and his two last books, Summits, Six Meetings That Shaped the 20th Century, that came um, last year, and uh, his book From Wo uh, World War to Cold War, Churchill, Roosevelt, and the International History of the 1940s, that came in 2006. So in terms of much of what David Reynolds has done earlier on has in a way been leading up to this book to do a broad overview of American history, both for an international and I'm sure also for an American audience. And in terms of the uh, positioning uh, of his own scholarship with regard to current international affairs, the need to understand America in its international setting, uh, he is someone who is exceptionally well prepared. So, uh, we are very much looking forward to hearing your lecture today, David. Welcome to the LSE, and it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Arnie, for your kind words. I always feel after an introduction like that, anything I say is going to be an anticlimax. But uh, anyway, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for turning out tonight on not the best of evenings, certainly. Out in Fenland, there's been plenty of snow last night and trains messed up, and I'm sure for all of you there's been a problem. So thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> yes, this, has, this is a look at the president, Obama, the new president, in the light of American history. Um, the book I've written is very much a, a popular history. It's intended to try and bring to um, a wider public the kind of work that's been done by many historians, uh, much greater specialists than I am, over recent years. Um, 
But I think there is a place for this. In America, of course, if you, uh, the, all histories nowadays of the United States are written by a team. It's a kind of mass production process with everybody, people writing on their own century or their own aspect. And so to do, uh, for one person to do a single volume is, is an act of hubris. But uh, you start with that, you recognize it's impossible, and then you have an awful lot of fun writing it. And, uh, uh, and I found that. So um, you know, for better or worse, that's what it's all about. Anyway, what I want to do this evening is to try and situate Obama in some of the larger patterns of American history, some of the themes that I've talked about in the book and um, in the series of programs that's on, on Radio 4 as well. Um, so let's begin with, yes, with the inauguration, with that moment that so many people watched on television all over the world. Uh, Obama taking the oath, I do solemnly swear. Well, actually, he wasn't very solemn. If, if you remember, that's when the Chief Justice flubbed his words, and so uh, they all had a good laugh and, uh, and had to start again. But anyway, that is the moment at which uh, a man, a woman, eventually becomes President of the United States, and uh, uh, that's the moment for real. <clears throat> As I was finishing the book, um, and in particular thinking about the election campaign, it did seem to me that in many ways that campaign summed up some of the themes in the book, in a way almost uh, personalised them, the, 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 the candidates incarnated certain themes in the book. And I just want to remind you of that, the election campaign seems a long time ago now, but um, that was Obama on election night in Chicago. You remember him? John McCain. McCain, for me, in a sense, symbolized or expressed the imperial side of American history, this uh, evocation of America as a modern-day empire. There he is as a Vietnam veteran, uh, coming back after a number of years as a prisoner of war, uh, quite seriously wounded. Uh, being introduced to Richard Nixon. So this is a man who had involved himself, had committed himself for good or ill to America's uh, fight in Vietnam, the Cold War struggle. But he was, of course, also the son of two other, the son of a, uh, another veteran and indeed the grandson. Here are two admirals of empire, if you like, um, uh, 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 McCain's father and grandfather. His grandfather was a commander in the Pacific during the Second World War uh, and died, I think, of heart failure just as the war was coming to an end. And this is one of the last photographs of uh, grandfather and father, as it were, McCain's grandfather and father together. Um, uh, McCain's father was an admiral uh, during the, uh, the Vietnam War. So here is a man who, in a, in a sense, uh, expressed that whole pattern of America as a, a modern-day empire. Then we had another candidate, Hillary Clinton, uh, the first woman who had been chosen as a candidate, presidential candidate for a major political party, for a mainstream political party. So part of, of course, the fascination of Obama and, and Clinton was the sense that whoever won the Democratic nomination, it was going to be a first in American history. And she represents, it seems to me, that tr a pattern of uh, America's recent past. Here she is as a student feminist. Uh, there's been a few makeovers in Hillary's career um, since then. And uh, somebody who came of age, having been you know, initially something of a conservative uh, uh, growing up in the Midwest, came of age during the era of women's liberation, uh, as a march in uh, Washington uh, in the early 70s. Um, that whole movement in American life that began to open up the uh, uh, character of politics, spinning off from the civil rights movement, the demand for rights for blacks, and then rights for women, rights for gays, and the whole rights revolution, which has been so much a part of American life in the last third of the 20th century. So she represented, as it were, one pattern for uh, a modern-day American woman. And then, of course, we have Sarah Palin, uh, 
whom nobody had heard about in August and everybody had heard about by the end of September. Uh, and for a few days, it, uh, a week or two, it almost seemed that she had completely overturned the election campaign. That was at least until reality returned with um, the collapse of the banks and so on in the middle of September. And Palin and Palin's support and, and what she um, uh, arouses in America is, of course, a sense of heartland American values, uh, libertarian values. Um, the, the right to own and use a gun, a different kind of right uh, from the one that Hillary Clinton represents. Um, and also behind that, the biblical faith that is uh, a central part of uh, heartland American values. And indeed, one of the things I've tried to draw out in the book repeatedly is the way that uh, evangelical Protestantism is not simply something that hit the headlines in a strange way from the days of, say, Ronald Reagan, the moral majority onwards, George W. Bush, but has been a part of American history right through to the earliest days, to the 18th century, uh, to the Great Awakening. And that it has provided much of the moral fervor of American politics. Initially, uh, if you like, on the left, in the sense that, or what we might consider the left, in the sense that it was in support of liberal causes. Uh, religion animated much of the abolitionist movement against slavery, for example. Spinning off from that in the middle of the 19th century, movements for women's suffrage, many women uh, cut their teeth politically in the middle of the 19th century in uh, uh, protests about slavery. Um, but then, of course, in the 20th century, morphing uh, into uh, much more of a conservative force, um, a reflection of uh, the South and the, the Southern values that have become somewhat marginalized in American life and then sprang back into uh, prominence in the, the late uh, 20th century. So Palin representing that conservative phase of a biblical faith that has been very much a part of American history and one that I think is important to emphasize because we tend to think of it or have tended to think of it as essentially a, uh, a secular state or at least with a rigid separation between church and state. So candidates, those three candidates, each really representing in striking ways, I think, patterns in American history, some of them recent patterns, others patterns that, that go way back into the American past. Which then, of course, brings me to the guy who won. Here he is, the first black president of the United States, um, standing behind the, uh, at a, uh, a, a lectern with the seal of office there uh, it, on it. So it very graphically states the, the novelty of this uh, occasion. And of course, for Obama, he is, uh, as he made great play of in the uh, run up to the inauguration, thinking very much of uh, Lincoln, whose birthday, uh, 200th birthday, if you like, will be celebrated next week, 12th of February, uh, when most of the British media will be concentrating on the birth of Charles Darwin. Abraham Lincoln was born on the same day, spare a thought for him. Um, and Lincoln as the man who ended up emancipating the slaves, giving them their freedom, not something he necessarily in he intended to do at the beginning of the Civil War, but nevertheless, that's what eventually happened. And that illustration of, of Lincoln almost as a kind of Christ-like figure, a Messiah figure, was uh, evoked something of the feeling that he um, aroused among uh, black Americans at the end of the Civil War, the sense of him as a liberator. What was interesting, I found, about Obama's inaugural address was that although he is America's first black president, he did not make a big pitch about that. If you think back, say, to John Kennedy in 1961, uh, talking about the uh, torch having been passed, the torch having been passed to a new generation of Americans, um, Obama could have said something like that about becoming America's first black president. But he didn't. He did not rub it in. Maybe because it was quite enough to see that picture of the man in front of the lectern saying, President of the United States, the man was 
the message. You didn't have to say it. But also because I think Obama's intention, whether it proves to be the case uh, in reality, is to be an inclusive uh, uh, president trying to draw the country together and really to rub that point in is not necessarily uh, productive or necessary. Nevertheless, in that speech, there were some quite striking comments about uh, America's past, about the uh, place of slavery in a country that was dedicated in principle to liberty. For example, that reference to people having endured the lash of the whip of ta having tasted the bitter swill of civil war and segregation. A very powerful phrase, that. One of the most powerful, I think, in the, the speech. And then, very poignantly, just pointing out that a man whose father less than 60 years ago might not have been served at a local restaurant can now stand before you to take a most sacred oath. So in a way, Obama said it in those small phrases as much as making a rigging Kennedy-esque declaration. And I think that was a calculated strategy in that speech. So Obama is America's first black president, yes, but a very different kind of black president than some of the aspirants in the past. He's not, for instance, Jesse Jackson. Uh, there's Jackson running in 88 for the Demo trying to get the Democratic nomination. Jackson, uh, I think the grandson of slaves, grown up in the South with the whole burden of segregation, discrimination, the Jim Crow laws, and of course, uh, closely associated, fundamentally associated with the civil rights movement. Here he is on the balcony um, of the motel in Memphis, Tennessee, just before uh, Martin Luther King there and the um, second from the right uh, was shot in 1968. So Jackson, in a sense, was somebody who bore the burden of Southern history. And it was a crippling burden, uh, and one that led to a whole strategy for trying to overthrow that burden of discrimination, uh, the civil rights movement in the 60s, but left also a sense of bitterness, of anger, entirely understandable if you've lived with it, but in some ways not perhaps politically productive. Obama, in a sense, took on the mantle of American blackness. Obama has this remarkable kind of background where he is the son of an African, not an African-American, and the son on the other side, his mother's side, of an American, white American. So his, and he writes about this in his books, um, he, in a sense, had to learn and understand the nature of blackness in the United States because growing up, and uh, he could play it either way, in a way. He could associate with whites, he could associate with blacks. It was, you know, it, it could go either way. And. I think it's interesting and important to say that Obama is the first black president, but he is something different. In certain ways, maybe he will be the first post-black president. He reminds me of Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods uh, also had a kind of problem, if you like, with what was his racial identity. And his father, the first time he won, uh, Woods won the... Um, the American Open and put on the, uh, the green jacket said, you know, it's great that we've got a black wearing the green jacket. And uh, Woods was not happy with this. Am I a black? And in the end, he said no. He coined a word for it. He called himself cablination to reflect the complex racial background that he had. Caucasian, black, Indian, and Asian. So this is somebody who is multi-ethnic and understood himself in that way, as indeed Obama, I think, does. And this seems to be important because 
maybe what we have is, yes, the first black American, first black American president, but also the first mixed race president. And maybe this is a sign of the future as America moves out of its fundamentally color-coded past into something rather different. Let's just think about that for a moment in terms of, of future trends. <clears throat> in 2008, whites constitute about two-thirds of the American population. Whites in inverted commas because the US census um, really operates on whatever categories, racial, so-called racial categories, uh, people choose to opt for. So this is, as it were, self-styled whites. Of the rest, 15% are Hispanic, 13% black, 5% Asian. OK, so that's where we are now. In 2050, Census Bureau projects that whites will be 46% of the US population. In other words, less than a majority. And this is a comment that struck me from a demographer at the Brookings Institute. He said, Obama is 2050, multiracial, multiethnic. By then, by 2050, the term Hispanic and the term white will have no meaning because there will be so much intermixing. Now, I don't think I'll be alive to see whether that's true or not, but I think it's an interesting projection because, as I say, it may be that all that those racial categories which have preoccupied American history and in a way uh, strangled it uh, for so long may be becoming things of the past. And of course, some of these comments are also applicable to other countries, including our own, and not just uh, the United States. So that, I think, is, is something to say about Obama as the first black president and also perhaps, in some ways, the first post-black president. Let's think a little more about the speech and the, some of the things he said in it <clears throat> and some of the patterns that they might suggest for future policy and some of the ways in which those echo things from America's past. Here are a few things that he said on foreign policy. These are, as it were, things that struck me and other things will have struck you perhaps, but I'm just sharing with you my own perceptions. Um, Early on in the speech, a very firm statement, for those who seek to advance their aims by inducing terror, you cannot outlast us and we will defeat you. A message that it was politically and diplomatically essential to state to show that Obama was not going to be a soft touch for terrorists. But, of course, then some very striking comments that you would not have found George W. Bush saying. To the Muslim world, we seek a new way forward based on mutual interest and mutual respect. And already in the first week there have been attempts to start that kind of dialogue. And also a particularly striking line, we will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist. Uh, already, some signs that that has had an effect, uh, not least in, uh, if recent reports are anything to go by, in Soviet attitudes to at least discussing uh, arms control. So a different kind of rhetoric there, despite the, the first point about firmness in American foreign policy, uh, a more flexible, a more uh, negotiating kind of mode. And of course, it's, it's, it's natural in retrospect, given what happened with the Iraq war and given what has happened with the Bush presidency, to see all this as very much a condemnation of the last eight years and of the, um, the uh, mistakes of the Bush administration. But I suspect that for, and I, I don't anticipate that George Bush is ever going to go up very far on the scale of, of great American presidents. I think he's going to be lingering pretty low. 
But of course, all presidents get their revisionist wave in, in time. And I think part of what will be recovered by future historians is what you, all of us in this room, can probably remember if we go back to that day, which is the impact of 9-11 um, and the, the effect it had on people all over the world. Um, uh, to give you just a personal example, my wife is American, and over the years she's got used to uh, living in England of you know many jibes about America, American foreign policy, and the crassness of American life, whatever. Um, and sometimes when people have decided they liked her, they've, they've assumed she's Canadian, which uh, uh, <laughs> she always was intrigued by. Anyway, um, on the day after, or in the, in the days after that attack, she was very struck and very moved at the way people would come up to her in the street, people she knew slightly or whatever, and say, how are you? You know, almost put their arm around or something. It was an enormously powerful feeling. Now, probably we can all remember something of that, that shock and that, the power of that. And of course, for Americans, it was particularly overwhelming because this was a country whose history had been one of almost total immunity in, recent, in the recent past from the kind of wars that had been uh, a fact of life for most of the rest of the world. Uh, back in 1814, the British burnt the, the, the Washington, the White House. Uh, in 18, the 1860s, Americans fought their own civil war. Really, for most of the 20th century, there was no substantial trouble, no, no, no wars that touched America's heartland. In 1941, it's an attack on an outpost of America, a quasi-colonial one, in fact, Hawaii, that was part of, uh, annexed as part of that brief wave of formal empire that Americans engaged in the 1890s. It was an attack at Hawaii, 2,000 miles from the West Coast, that precipitated America's involvement in the war. The heartland of America, the continental United States, was hardly touched by the war. I think there were a few uh, Japanese um, shells uh, from midget submarines that landed on the California coast and things like this. But nothing comparable to, say, uh, the experience of this country, which was bombed but not occupied, to continental Europe, which was occupied and was a battlefield, let alone to the western part of the Soviet Union, which was ravaged, in a sense, twice by war as the German army advanced and then eventually was pushed back. So that whole experience, and of course then you can go on to China and the ruinous wars uh, associated with the Second World War, the Japanese invasion, the communist takeover, to Vietnam, Indochina, most of the world has had an experience of vulnerability that was not the experience of 20th century Americans until then. And so the sense that the heart of America was under attack was enormously important, viscerally important. And it's clear, and one of the things I, I write about in the book, it, it, you know, it's clear that it did have an enormously powerful effect on George Bush when he went to ground zero. Bush, remember, was a president who started in 2001 really with, without a very clear sense of where he was going in foreign policy. If you judged from the kind of rhetoric in the first months of his presidency, he's inaugurated in, in January 2001, um, you know, you think that probably one of the big issues is going to be China, how you deal with China, how far it's going to be a partner, how far it's going to be a foe, and so on. Um, but certainly, as we all know, Issues of terrorism and so on were pretty much off the Bush administration's radar. And for the first few days after 9-11, Bush really wasn't clear quite what he was saying. His line frequently was, we feel for the people who have been killed. We feel for their relatives and so on. Uh, going to ground zero, uh, I think three days afterwards, supposedly just to talk to rescue workers and, and give them some encouragement. He found it was, uh, he, he said this in interviews later, um, it was like going into a kind of smoking arena. Uh, it was like that the sense of uh, the power of the destruction and also 
the enormous desire of the people there, that the, the rescue workers and so on, for revenge, uh, for getting back at the people who'd done this. And Bush said, you know, he suddenly felt he was rather like America, he was like a gladiator in this arena, and that he was called, called to draw the sword for the United States. Um, and that visit was enormously powerful, I think, in giving him a sense of, of mission. And once Bush had a sense of mission, given his, his Christian mentality and so on, he was very happy to go with that. But it's also true of other leaders. Tony Blair went to ground zero. Blair also had a strong religious conviction. John Howard did, the Australian leader. I don't think he had particularly, but they were all burned by what they saw. And I think that, in part, is why that whole thing, the whole theme, took hold so powerfully uh, for the Bush administration. This was an unprecedented experience in recent American history, uh, and reactions to it were not particularly clear and rational. Obviously, then, neocons and others exploited this as a way of, of carrying, finishing off, supposedly, the work that had been left undone in Iraq. But I think this sense of of being almost terrorized by terror was something that would be, was a theme of the Bush presidency. And in a way, it was not going to be broken until that leadership had gone. And in a way, what Obama is in a position to do is move beyond terror and the almost paralyzing effect it had on American foreign policy in its focus on this particular issue or set of issues. OK, so those are a few observations on foreign policy, where it's going and where it's come from. Just, I'd like to say a few words about domestic um, developments as well. What had Obama to say here? Well, here are some of the things that struck me. We will act not only to create new jobs, but to lay a new foundation for growth. We will build the roads and bridges, the electric grids and digital lines that feed our commerce and bind us together. Obama, it was expected, would, in a sense, offer something like a, an updated New Deal, like Roosevelt had offered in the 1930s. Um, and what he's doing here is, of course, talking about a new foundation for growth. Um, the electric grids and digital lines. One of the great achievements of Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s, not often noticed, is the electrification of rural America. He brought electric power to the farms of, of America in a way that transformed people's lives, enabled them to have fridges, electric lights, changed the whole attitude to food and cooking, all the basic kinds of things. Obama is saying, well, we're going to update that. We're going to move on into the, properly into the digital age. And of course, the moment he got into the Oval Office, he realized how important that was, because by all accounts, the, the Bush administration's IT systems were, to say the least, pretty primitive. Um, so it needed to start right at the heart of American government. So that's one of the things that I suspect he will try and push hard, because it's not just, as it were, uh, jobs and growth, but new kinds of growth. And growth that reflects what he has a sense of some of the priorities for 21st century America. Um, that it's got to be green, green kind of growth. We will harness the sun and the winds and the soil to fuel our cars and run our factories. We will work tirelessly to roll back the spectre of a warming planet. Again, not something that you really would have expected George Bush to say until perhaps the very last um, flutterings of his presidency. And what Obama is touching on here is, of course, the, the challenge of, uh, if you like, environmentalism in a country where there has been uh, uh, an abundance of resources. The United States developed for many reasons, but not least because it happened to sit on some of the most important natural resources uh, for modern industrial development, large uh, coal fields, iron fields, an abundance of timber, 
oil later on, um, tremendously important. And if you think of the you know, other comparable land masses, um, uh, countries like Canada or Australia, um, which have considerable mineral endowments, but not in the same way and not with the same potential for exploitation as the United States has. So it's been, as the frontier has moved west, uh, as part of that theme of American history, the growth of an internal empire as the Americans took over a whole continent. So it has been an empire of abundance and also an empire of exploitation in which resources were simply uh, ripped off and then people uh, moved on with very little sense of the environmental implications. On the other hand, from, say, the late 19th century, so at the beginning of the 20th century, there has been uh, a much more, uh, there has been, as it were, an undercurrent of concern about these kinds of issues. It, it started with the development of national parks in the United States. Yellowstone, I think, dates from 1872. And particularly the, the gospel of conservation that was preached by Teddy Roosevelt. There he is, um, uh, not easy to see, well, you can see it actually, yes, with his, uh, his um, characteristic sort of safari hat on. Uh, Roosevelt doing an enormous amount for the protection of forest lands, um, um, uh, the great spaces of the West, Grand Canyon, places like that, and also insisting on the limits of American resources a whole century ago. Franklin Roosevelt, um, his relative, uh, also taking that sort of line in the 1930s. Um, but I think we may expect that Obama will at least have a sense of that and its importance in the future as well. It'd be interesting to see how he delivers on that. Now, I've talked so far about, um, as it were, Obama's agenda or some features of Obama's agenda as they came out in the inaugural address. And there is, of course, a huge amount of expectation and anticipation about what he will do now he is president. But what he has already found, you can hear this from some of the headlines, and which I'm sure he has discovered even more searchingly within himself, is the limits of the presidency of the Oval Office. Uh, that, I think, was John Kennedy. Um, have you entered a powerhouse or have you entered a prison? And Obama's struggles to keep his BlackBerry, for example, are an, exam an instance of his feeling that he's easily going to be locked in to this place. Harry Truman talked about it as a jail. When he, got, uh, when he was able to campaign in the 1948 election, having been president for three years, he said it's like getting out of jail, getting out to the country, seeing the people, and so on. This sense of imprisonment, but worse than that, the sense sometimes of uh, just an amazing impotence when you're at the heart of power, is the experience of most American presidents. However charismatic they seem, however powerful they seem in uh, th their position. So let me just remind you of some of the realities of power. You know this, but it's worth just underlining it. There we have the White House, but of course the president is elected entirely separately from the Congress. And in much of American history, there's no, a president of one party would have to face a Congress of the other party. Even if the president had majorities in both houses, as Obama does, uh, American party discipline is much less tight than in Britain. People get into Congress because of their own efforts, their own fundraising, their own contacts, and they need to keep their feet firmly on the ground locally. That's where their credibility lies. Not so much with the party in the way that would be true of, of Conservative or Labour MPs here today in Britain. Um, so even if, as Obama has, uh, you, know, you have democratic majority in both, both houses, that doesn't mean that those Democrats are always going to do what the president wants. And as already we've seen that the Republicans are not particularly willing to do so. So that is part of the nature or the limits of American power, the power of the presidency. And if we go back over the 20th century, 
and think about who were the great reforming presidents, the presidents who actually had the, that, that fortuitous conjunction uh, in politics of uh, president of one party, majorities, powerful majorities in, of their own party in, in the Congress. There are not many of these presidents, and they didn't have that situation for very long. At the beginning of the century, Woodrow Wilson, 1913, Wood Wilson's first couple of years, uh, when he was in a position to push through major pieces of legislation on tariffs, on Federal Reserve, and so on. Franklin Roosevelt, of course, 1930, coming to presidency in 1933. For much of Roosevelt's first term, he was in a very strong political position. But he had a, um, a, a Democratic Party that was fractious, that on the one hand included Southern Conservatives, uh, who were the uh, leadership in the Congress, and also um, urban, ethnic, uh, uh, blue-collar workers in the North, who were often the people who were pushing for more radical reforms and certainly got those in the, by 1935 against what the president wanted on things like labor relations and so on. And of course, Roosevelt's second term um, ran into the sands pretty quickly. By 1938, the Republicans are bouncing back into Congress. And if Roosevelt had ended his presidency after two terms, which would have been the normal pattern, if he'd retired in January 1941, he would probably have been regarded as a president who had helped to deal with the Depression, but hadn't really resolved it, because by that stage, you're still uh, a president. Uh, there's still unemployment of maybe 17, 18% of the workforce. Um, uh, what really gave Roosevelt's presidency the, the kind of elevation that it has now in, in our historical reckoning is, of course, that he ran again in 1940 because of the world crisis and ended up as a, a president who was elected four times. And that will never happen again because the Constitution has been changed. So Roosevelt's presidency, as far as domestic concerns uh, matter, were, ran into the sands pretty, pretty soon. Lyndon Johnson, uh, after the 1964 election, Johnson having majorities that enabled him to push through fundamental legislation on voting rights and on, uh, on the war against poverty. But then, of course, Johnson, uh, a man who believed that he, ha he could do what Franklin Roosevelt couldn't do, he had the, the nerve, the persistence and drive to do it, then, of course, uh, completely miscalculating how he could handle the war in Vietnam and how he could have that as well as domestic reform. And the man who had triumphed so resoundingly in 1964 did not dare run for re-election in 1968 because he knew he would have been crucified by the voters. Uh, so Johnson, in many ways, is one of the, the, uh, the most striking examples of a, a, a powerful man, a, a power broker in Congress, a man who believed in power, knew how to handle it, who was crushed by the burdens of the presidency. And then, of course, very different character, Ronald Reagan, in his first couple of years, 1981, coming in not with um, uh, Republican majorities, but certainly with enough margin, particularly if he drew on the support of conservative Democrats, to push through some of his own programs. But again, it doesn't, it didn't last for very long. So what I'm just saying in conclusion is that it's Interesting to hear the Obama agenda. Some of those things, I suspect, are going to be very significant. But we have to remember that what a president says and what he delivers are very different things. They have been in, American, in the past in American history, and I think they will be uh, again here. Maybe Obama understands that. One of the lines that struck me most in the speech was this line, God calls us to shape an uncertain destiny, an uncertain destiny. Um, an echo probably of Franklin Roosevelt's speech in 1936 in the election campaign where he said that Americans had a rendezvous with destiny, a rendezvous with destiny. I think a very Roosevelt kind of phrase, rendezvous is kind of folksy and, and so on. And it's also you know, you encounter it, you embrace it, and then you kind of ride on into the, into the sun or sunset or whatever it is. But uh, what Obama is saying is something different, you know, an uncertain destiny. Yes, America has a destiny. All presidents believe that. There's all the, always this sense of a providential nation under God and with a special place in history. But the destiny is uncertain. And it's also 
for Americans to shape. God calls on us to shape an uncertain destiny. And one of the themes that runs, ran through that speech was emphasis on individual responsibility, on service, on, if you like, recreating America's civic culture and civil society, which has been uh, under strain, and which many analysts have, have asked whether it's fading in recent years. So for me, that's a line which is, uh, I think, quite striking. God calls on us to shape an uncertain destiny. So there is, uh, in a, uh, a short period of time, is, in a very sketchy way, are my perceptions of the 44th president and where he comes from and where he might be going, and very happy now to answer questions and discuss it. Thank you very much, David, for... Uh giving us an overview of the grand sweep of American history, a wonderful, a wonderful lecture that put today's uh, situation and the presidency just started into an historical uh, perspective. Uh, the quote at the end it also echoed for me um, Teddy Roosevelt, who was very fond of speaking of America's certain destiny. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether Obama was aware of that. I think it's actually in his in his inaugural, uh, where that was used. But I, I want to start with a question. We're going to have about um, 20 minutes, 25 minutes for Q&A here. We want to start with a question uh, about the other part of that quote that you ended up with, David, the God calls on us part. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I really found interesting with your book is your discussion, which you also touched upon here tonight, on the role of, of, of religion in American history and the changing roles that it has played over time. Um, and you pointed out in your lecture here tonight that the main change seemed to have happened around the middle part of the 20th century, with religion going for being, at least in many parts of the country, a force for reform, over onto being a force for uh, conservatism, uh, in some cases being seen uh, even as a reactionary force within, within the United States. So a two-pronged question on that. What do you think caused that change mm. in mid-20th century America? And then secondly, with the election of Obama, a religious president in his own right, uh, but one who approaches his religious convictions in a political sense from the left or the left center, is this about to change? Yes. Um I mean, all presidents, I think, almost all of them have, have as it were, invoked God in their speeches and, and so on. Um, so that the, the, the religious, religious um, uh, pattern of American political culture, I think, has remained unchanged. What is striking, as you say, is this, um, on what end of the political spectrum religion has provided the kind of dynamism. As I said, in the... 19th century, it was a very powerful force for things like um, uh, the abolition of slavery, also, of course, uh, for uh, temperance reform against um, drink. I mean, it was one of the main, the church is one of the main lobbies for prohibition in the early uh, 20th century. It had been a local issue, and it, it finally got to the national level in, um, during the First World War. Um, one of the things that... Uh, struck me, and, and I've written about it a bit in the book, is, is th that um, after the, or during and after the First World War, um, evangelical Protestants, particularly in the South, were much exercised by the new gospel of Darwinism. We're back with Darwin again. Um, and also the kind of the rhetoric of social Darwinism. You know, that, that in the world as, uh, of, of human beings, as well as the world of nature, there was a struggle for survival, uh, the survival of the fittest, the fittest races, and so on, which, of course, was, um, had become part of uh, American racial ideology by this time, but also was very much part of the rhetoric of the First World War. Mm. And William Jennings Bryan, who'd been a very successful, um, uh, well, he'd not been a very successful, been a very notable uh, presidential candidate in the, um, uh, in the 1890s, um, mounted a big campaign in the early 20s uh, to deal with what he called the menace of Darwinism. And it was partly Darwin on evolution, 
but it was also, as it were, the ethics of Darwinism, this idea that everything was about struggle and violence. And that comes to a head in um, the very famous Scopes trial in, in Tennessee um, in 1925, I think, um, in which Brian goes on the stand in the end in um, uh, an encounter with Clarence Darrow, who's one of the great trial lawyers of the day. And um, uh, Darrow exposes uh, Brian's complete ignorance of, of everything, not just to do with biblical criticism or history or geology. Uh, language is the whole lot. And uh, this is a national event. I mean, there's 200 newspapers covering it. It's actually on live radio and things like this. Um, and for a lot of people in the 1920s, and remember this is a time of sort of great technological change of modernity in America. It's, you know, people getting automobiles and things like this, radios. Um, this is, in a sense, is the sort of death knell of that old-style evangelical Protestantism with its faith based in, in the Bible in a literal sense. And, and what happened, and I'm getting around to your, an answer to your question, is um, what happened is a way is that people then said, okay, that's the end of that whole tradition. Uh, and therefore were enormously surprised when it suddenly burst on the national scene in the 19, late 70s with moral majority and so on and then the Reagan years, Bush, George W. Bush. What actually happened is that it went underground in the American South in particular, mm. not entirely in the American South, but um, it became, having as it were raised its head politically and, and, and really had its head knocked off, it developed almost an own, its own subculture, lots of Bible colleges, lots of Bible schools, um, uh, churches that were emphasizing the biblical faith and building up their resources and things like this. So it became a sort of slightly unnoticed subculture in American life, but a powerful one, and one increasingly associated with the South and the whole way of life in the rural South. And I think part of what brought it if you like, out of that ghetto was the attack on Southern values that was seen to be, you know, the civil rights movement was seen to be the thin end of the wedge of that attack on Southern values. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, so that it, it, it really starts to mobilize politically in the 1960s. The Goldwater campaign in 64, a lot of people of that background got involved in Goldwater's campaign. And there was a growing sense that this, um, the attempt to change the south Southern etiquette on race was the thin end of a wedge of trying to change a whole lot of other things about Southern life, which included religion, but also were to do with the whole question, and we get back to liberty and changing various means of liberty, you know, the intervention of the federal government in the lifestyle of the localities. For most Americans, that's what liberty means. It means the government keeps out of their way of life. And so evangelical Protestantism was bound up with all that. Now, and then we've had these surges of, as it were, conservative evangelicalism coming up in politics. The interesting question now, I think, is whether, whether this is, as it were, a durable American tradition that will continue to set it apart from Europe, or whether the patterns of secularization that have taken hold in Europe in the late 20th century will eventually affect America as the South has opened up to the rest of the nation, and also the rest of the nation has kind of impinged and intruded on the South. So that's a rather long answer to your question, but it seems to me that it started as a national liberalizing force, or at least it was in the North, it, it, evangelical religion. It became more associated with the South and the preservation of a Southern culture. And the question, you know, is whether that will all be eroded in the 21st century in the way that's happened to local religious cultures in parts of Europe, or whether it will remain a durable part of American life. Thank you, David. Now, I'll start with a couple of questions from the audience down here. Then I will stand up and I will actually see people uh, up on the balcony who want, want to ask questions. I've been informed that we only have one microphone. Um, and unfortunately for you up there, it's down here. So you will have to shout when you're asking your questions. Um, but anyone, anyone who spent any time at LSE are generally quite good at shouting, so it shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a problem. 
Questions? Yes, please. Could we have the mic? Do we have the mic down here? Yeah, please use the mic so the people upstairs can hear. Please. President Obama's uh, stimulus package uh, is quite insular. I mean, there's a lot of tariffs. Is he going to circle the wagons and put a, you know, have an America first policy? Or is he going to kind of spread uh, the, you know, the empire of liberty across the world? Yeah, if, David, is it, is it all right if I take another question? Yeah, sure, yeah, if yeah, yeah. Was, mm -hmm. just, to, just to group them. Any, any other questions? Down here, I can barely see. Yes, please. Thank, thank you very much. My, my name's John Ewan, and I want to ask a question about Afghanistan because the President has uh, indicated an early priority of his is to try to resolve the situation there. Is there any reason to believe that he will succeed where the British and the Soviets didn't? Two rather different questions there, David. Yeah, yeah okay. Well, I mean, on the, on the first one I, about Obama's um, economic package and how far it's going to be protectionist or insular, um, I mean, I think he has... Uh, uh, persuaded the Senate to be to remove some elements of that um, protectionist side. Uh, but um, there will be enormous pressures upon him to take that line. I think his, the administration's view, and it would certainly be the view from the relevant uh, government departments, Commerce and uh, Treasury and State, would be to, to um, uh, maintain a, a, you know, a reasonable degree of openness. But this would be an example of where um, the localism of the interests of congressmen really plays a part because what they are getting messages about is protecting jobs in, you know, Peoria, Illinois, or whatever it is. And the way apparently to do that, as we've seen in, you know, this country in the last week, seems to be, you know, um, you know, to, to provide work for Americans, to provide markets for Americans, and so on. So this will be a struggle, I think, between President and, and, and Congress. Um, and it remains to be seen what the outcome will be. Uh, on the question of Afghanistan, well, I mean, Arnie could answer this as well as I could. But um, yeah, I mean, I would have thought that what you will, grad what you will see happening is the crafting of, in, in due, due course, of a, a plausible exit strategy. Yeah. I don't think you know, there's any reason to suppose that uh, this conflict is going to go any better than the ones you've mentioned. Um, uh, I think that the United States, like the other participants, really would, would now be looking to get out in a way that saves face. And uh, I don't think there's, I don't see a, a, any great possibility of something else. I think my worry is that it will get a lot bloodier before that exit strategy actually materializes. But I will now take questions from upstairs, if there are any. Anyone? No, that I can see over there, please. Please. I've heard... Um, Obama described as the, probably the um, first time we've had an educated president. And my, my own recollections of presidential campaigns in the past is that it has been influenced by the immense wealth of the individual candidates and the influence that they have over the, the friends in the, the Senate. Um, I'd like to hear your views on Obama and perhaps the lack of wealth, I don't know how, whether he's a wealthy man or not, and how he managed to um, slip through the system, as I see. Mm. Thank you. And then there's a question over there. Yeah, the first row, yeah, please. Yeah, just two brief points. First, um, uh, we don't really have terribly much indication, I think, of his, of his approach internationally other than in one or two instances. I'm thinking particularly of China, and I find the comments of Treasury Secretary Geithner about the Chinese manipulating the currency. It's a more confrontational stance, actually, than George Bush took, and it's a very important relationship. Do you think that uh, President Obama is ready so early in his term to give a lead at the G20 summit, the very necessary lead, uh, in terms of uh, restructuring the international financial framework? And the second point is, would you agree it's a very serious setback this, this week with the loss of Tom Daschle, forgetting the circumstances 
circumstances. Here was a man with his expertise in healthcare reform, a very central plank in the domestic platform, and also with great popularity in the Senate. And it's really going to distract uh, President Obama a great deal because he's got to find someone up to his kind of ability and contacts, which is going to be very difficult for him to do. Some very good questions. And now you toss David is to right. put this into historical perspective. All right. Um, well, is he the first educated president? I think that's probably a little hard on his, his, all his predecessors. Um, I mean, John, John F. Kennedy had been through Harvard. Whether it had a big effect on him, I don't know. But uh, um, uh, I mean, Obama obviously thinks about issues he is uh, able to take advice from a variety of sources. He's also able to draw his own conclusions. Um, you know, what matters in a president is not, you know, what is his personal IQ, brain power, whatever, but whether he can uh, take information from people that matter, varieties of information, so he's not imprisoned by one particular point of view, and make decisions about it. And two, you know, what we've seen so far is that Obama is actually quite good at doing that, listening, absorbing, and then also deciding, because you can't be a ditherer. Also, he does not appear to be an obsessive micromanager. I and mean, if you take somebody like Jimmy Carter, Carter was well-educated, well-informed, and actually was very up to speed on certain very important issues, nuclear issues, um, environment, and so on. But Carter could not stop getting involved in detail. Um, and, you know, so the education level of president, I think, is not the whole story. It's, it's, it's this balancing of, of skills. Um, what about his wealth? And how did he slip through the system? Well, you know, I mean, let's not make Obama into a saint. Um, I mean, this is a remarkable man. But he is, you know, I mean, he's fiercely ambitious. Uh, if you take Abraham Lincoln as his model, Lincoln was ferociously ambitious as well. Um, Lincoln wanted the presidency, and Lincoln gradually worked out what he would do with the presidency. And he was, he went through the furnace in the end to understand what he wanted to do with it, and that's part of why I think he's become such a powerful president, because if you look at those pictures of him over the years, there is a sense of somebody who has been through the fire. Um, of course, an appalling fire of civil war, um, which he had to uh, live with the knowledge that he had sent people into battle and to their deaths. So it's a different kind of story. But, you know, uh, Obama, I think, um, hasn't slipped through the system. I mean, he's, you know, he's played the system very effectively with virtues and, you know, less agreeable sides. But nobody gets to be president, nobody gets to be prime minister if they're not ambitious. Um, his wealth, well, it's interesting, I mean, I, to give you an anecdote, I mean, I don't have um, lots of anecdotes about Obama, but I did hear this from somebody who was um, a volunteer on the Obama campaign, I think, in Florida, and um, was responsible at some point in the campaign for hosting Obama's wife when she came down to do something. And she gave some talks in various parts. And then she said she was very keen in the evening that, before she flew back to Chicago, that all the volunteers should get together and there would be a Q&A session with her. Um, and she said to them, OK, you, know, you are putting yourselves out for us. So you ought to be in a position to know what you want to know, whatever you want to know, about us, about Barack and me. You know, our lifestyles, our finances, our prejudices, our hang-ups, you know, whatever it is. And so she just took these questions. And at the end, um, after she was going, this volunteer turned to some fairly seasoned political operator in the Democratic Party in, in, in Florida, and he said, have you ever seen anything like that before? And the guy said, no, never. You know, so you know, that is a side, of course, which um, you know, is striking and interesting. You know, that uh, these are clearly ambitious people, but there was, a, there was a sort of almost genuine populism here, mm. an approachability, which was, you know, had a big impact in that particular case. Now, that's a purely one anecdote, but I, I just pass it on. Um, China, well, I think I'll leave Arnie to answer that one. Um, um, 
uh, in general terms, well, or more specific terms, I mean, as to his, what he, how he's going to perform at the, at the G20 and so on, um, you know, what I said earlier, Obama is a quick learner. I think he will come up with, um, he will have something to say at that. It will also be, uh, I think, the aim will be consensual. It will be to work with the grain of uh, uh, the other leaders. Um, as to what his attitude to um, China will be, do you want to make any particular comment on that or not? No, I mean, just to connect it, I think, to the fact that uh, it's now becoming abundantly clear that um, uh, the, this had not been cleared with the World Ho White House before the um, statement, at least in the form that it was, it was given, went out. So rather than commenting on, on, on Sino-American relations, which I think we can, we can do in another context, what really strikes me here is that there, is, there are already some signs of some of the kind of coordination problems that do remind me a little bit of the Carter White House, certainly in the initial phase. Um, and one of my worries, which I've spoken about here before, is in terms of coordination, especially on foreign policy. Um, Obama has yet to bring all of his foreign policy team on board, I mean, within the White House, the staffers who will actually be on the NSC. And if his campaign is anything to go by, you know, he has an enormous range to choose from, from, you know, the Brzezinski family on the one side to, to Samantha Power mm. on the other. Um, uh, it's very easy to uh, be tempted to try to reunify these very different directions in terms of Democrat foreign policy within the White House. And I, I think it would be a terrible mistake to do that. But, um, you know, it's one of those cases where we would have to, we would have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are, among his advisors, people who are very hardline on China. First and foremost, those who've been working on the economic brief uh, for, for Obama. Uh, but there are others who see that relationship in a much more positive way and see it as part of the background for a successful presidency is to manage that well. Mm. Yes, I mean, I, uh, Obama has done better than, than Carter and Clinton did in getting people into position, but you, one of the things we always have to remember with an American president is the number of posts that have to be filled, which is far, 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 far greater than in this system where you have a career civil service and then, you know, there will be some political advisors parachuted into, you know, various departments, particularly if it's a, la a Labour government and so on, and there will be a, an enclave of people in, in the Prime Minister's office, but it's not anything like the problem of just finding people for jobs. And then, of course, going through the clearance and the vetting and the approvals of, 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 of Congress to get them through. And you've seen already, and this was the other question, you know, what, what happens when people's income tax returns are finally, you know, brought into the light of day. And, um, you know, all these nannies that they had been uh, having that they didn't, you know, pay tax on, whatever. I mean, the question about uh, the health, sec health secretary and, and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, Tom Dasher was very well qualified to, to deal with health care, and that was certainly from the campaign, one had a sense that that was going to be an Obama priority, but then a lot of things were going to be Obama priorities in the campaign, and the nature of, of a president, the nature of a leader, is having to choose. Um, uh, health care is such an impossible issue in the American system that, um, you know, even if somebody went about it more effectively than Bill and Hillary Clinton did, um, they're still going to have huge problems. And, uh, you know, I mean, if, if, if I'm not a betting man, but if I were putting money on Obama's presidency, a two-term presidency, and, you know, crystal ball gazing about uh, where we will be in, you know, 2017, I doubt that, you know, there will have been a radical reform of, of US healthcare by then whoever he gets. Yes, there's one question back there, and then on the first row here. Yes, please. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Joseph. I'm from the US. Uh, I have two points to bring up that I want to ask you, if you don't mind. Uh, the first uh, regards your comparison with uh, Barack Obama and that of Tiger Woods. Um, despite them being you know, of a kind of multiracial background, their approach in regards to the um, African-American experience, particularly in the States, completely different. Uh, particularly if you see with Obama, uh, his big point when he brought in the uh, woman in the wheelchair, 
who was over 100 years old and had only voted for the first time. Mm. Uh, even though he is, he did show that Americanism, that whole thing that we're all in this together. He never denied the fact that he was African. Same way that um, somewhat um, Tiger Woods, if anything, is shunned in the uh, African American community because he did that. That whole term that you just brought up together was not accepted at all by anyone. Second point uh, is regards to uh, religion. Um, the Southern experience, um, what I've seen, particularly from living in states, is something completely different than anyone else's experience. Um, it's particularly, uh, we saw that with Lincoln and then with um, LBJ, um, after the signing of the Civil War, a civil rights bill, um, his words were, we've lost the South forever. Um, we saw that, I mean, your rise, the whole thing about the rise of the ev evangelical right, I think, um, under Bush, kind of showed, I mean, it was something unique particularly to the state, something I've never seen before, something that had that much effect on the political system as it did. So, I mean, I, those are my difficulties, um, kind of understanding with your lecture. Mm -hmm. if you don't Sorry, so the, what you that. said at the end about it did have a lot of effect? I think it had presidency. more effect throughout, more during this term than mm -hmm. pr in previous history in, the, in American politics, and I just want you to clarify yeah. exactly what you meant. Thanks, good. Yes, please. At the front row. Yes. Um, my question was really about historiography, and I'd be interested to know what, where you thought your book fitted into a general American historiography. It would seem to me that with you know, the use of the word liberty, um, and perhaps I'm thinking as well of Simon Sharma and American democracy, um, you haven't really he heard or seen those titles since the 1950s and the consensus historians. So I wondered where you thought you, your book was placed in that, ge in that general scheme of things. And it would also seem to me as well that, um, or I'd be interested to know, with the election of Obama, do you think that there will be a new avenue of American historiography over the next few years? Something which is perhaps less ethnocultural, um, less uh, economically divided, less socially divided. You know, you might have to see a historiography in terms of some sort of cosmopolitanism, multiculturalism. I'd be interested to know what you thought of that. There's nothing like a good question on historiography uh, for, for, for historians to expand on what we really work on. What <laughs> rather than detail and uh, contemporaneities. Yes, please. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah, the question about uh, Obama and Tiger Woods. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to draw a direct comparison with them in the way that they are trying, you know, they understand the, the African-American experience or the American experience in general. More, it was to do with this kind of sense of multiracialism in American life and just hypothesizing that maybe the kind of rigid divisions that have afflicted American life in the past, this uh, you know, black versus white, white over black, you know, whatever, you know, if you think of a you know, famous, Jordan's famous book, um, whether that is still going to be the pattern of the future and so I instance Woods as somebody who had come, um, come up against that question and formulate his own answer, whether it's acceptable to many African Americans or not. But I suppose what I'm saying is that, uh, as I say, I won't, I won't be around to see whether it happens or not, but it seems to me interesting to know whether that whole way of talking about parts of the American experience will be the way we will be talking in 2050. And that's really the question that I was posing there by talking about both of them. On the Southern experience and the rest of the nation, well, uh, you know, you have lived through it and I, I'm certainly not going to, to contradict your own experiences. What, you know, and you mentioned uh, um, uh, Lyndon Johnson's comment about losing the, the South for a generation and so on. Well, I suppose that, in a sense, is what I'm saying. I mean, losing the South for a generation or losing the South forever, you know. I mean, is the South changing or is the South beginning to change? Has it started to change? Um, that seems to me an interesting question for the future. This is a, that's a part of the country which had a particularly powerful sense of its own identity and separateness Going back to the Civil War experience, I mean, I'm talking about well, the White South, but going back to the Civil War experience, and of course, it's rooted in all that and the kind of evocations of the Lost Cause and all that stuff. Um, and then was reinforced by the sense that the federal government was trying to tell them how to live their lives over uh, 
racial etiquette, as they called it, or whatever else. Um, but the question now is, you know, is that a, a pattern that's um, beginning uh, to break down? Is that a subculture that has begun to break down? As to the, you know, what are the, the effect of the religious right on the presidencies, what's striking, I think, is that the two presidents who got there through uh, very um, uh, open embracing of the religious right, Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, are both people who disappointed their backers. You know, Reagan did not deliver on the kind of basic issues that um, uh, the religious right wanted on issues such as abortion or whatever, or prayer in schools, um, because it would have been divisive, politically divisive and politically alienating. And the same is, you know, I think is true of George W. Bush. His rhetoric has been more, um, uh, you know, evangelical and so on than, 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 than Reagan's was. I mean, Reagan put it on when it needed to be put on. Um, so, I mean, Bush is more of a card-carrying member of that club, but he hasn't gone down that line. Because on some of these, you know, the big cultural war issues in the United States, they are so politically divisive that actually President and Congress steer away from them. Um, the abolition of prayer in schools and all that was done, you know, as a, uh, a freedom of speech measure by decisions of the Supreme Court in the, the 50s and 60s because it was offensive to Jewish people and things like this. And then, you know, they, people said, oh, well, this is, you know, something, a tradition that's been going on in the South we, or, or many parts of the country. Why can't we have prayer in school and so on? But it's basically a question that now President and Congress won't touch. Similarly, I, the same is true of abortion, that, that, that that's not an issue for the executive or the legislature are handled because it's so politically sensitive, which is part of why the Supreme Court has, in a sense, moved into that area and in a way feels it, it's in a position to do so. And one of the things I tried to bring out in the book is this very strange to us and uh, to, in Britain and very powerful role that the Supreme Court has in shaping policy, and in recent years particularly policy in areas that are sort of no-go areas politically, such as questions of abortion and so on. Um, so I would, I think, yes, um, the Bush administration, like the Reagan administration, embraced the rhetoric of the, the, the Christian right, but I think a lot of people on the right have been disappointed by the, the, just how much they've delivered. That would be my perspective. Historiography, or where does my book fit? Well, somebody else has got to decide that, but I don't think, I don't see it really so much as a you know, pattern of consensus history. I mean, the point of the, the way I frame the, the three themes in the book, Empire, Liberty, and Faith, is to say they're very powerful themes in American history, but also very paradoxical ones. Um, in other words, you know, this is a country that was an anti-empire, that broke away from the British Empire, but nevertheless became an empire, not just in the sense of becoming a superpower in the 20th century, but because it engrossed the American continent as an imperial power and, uh, you know, displaced the Native Americans and, uh, you know, uh, took Mexican territory and all the rest of it. I mean, this was imperialism in a in sort of neutral sense, I think, um, in neutral use of the term. Um, liberty, you know, this is a country that has preached the virtues of liberty and provided by European standards often very considerable opportunities um, for people, both in terms of having a vote and having land and so on, but whose liberty rested on the institution of slavery. Uh, and that was you know, the, the original sin in the sense of the United States. You know, it was born in liberty and in slavery. Um, and that's why Obama's election is so important in a sense of redeeming that or beginning to redeem that original sin. And faith, you know, this is a sense of a country that has in some ways kept church and state separate uh, in a way that's completely different from the experience historically of Europe, yet has also had this very powerful faith tradition. So I would have said it's, it's I don't know what label you'd put on it, but it's, I mean, it's a sense, uh, the book is uh, trying to give a sense of this sort of tortured nature of American history, which is what gives I, it, it its sort of epic, but sometimes horrific sort of character. Um, now, there will be a number of lectures 
uh, throughout this year, this term, in summer term, and in Mickelmore's term, um, next academic year, dealing with different aspects of American history, um, and also with political debates concerning the United States today. Uh, LSE Ideas has a new transatlantic program that is just getting started up. There will be a number of events in connection with that. I know that a number of you follow the Gilda Lehman lectures in American history that we do regularly here at LSE, and we've got three more of those coming up during, during that period. So it is um, a topic, particularly now, that it's uh, very important to focus on, not just in terms of contemporary discussions, but also in terms of what Professor Reynolds has done so well here today, which is to connect the present to the past, to try to understand uh, the origins of many of the political questions that will drive uh, the American political debate over the next four or possibly the next eight years. Uh, it was a great lecture, David. I'm very, very pleased that you came to LSE. I'm very, very good, very, very glad that so many showed up to, to listen to you tonight. There will be a book signing afterwards um, right outside this room where uh, you have a chance to buy Professor Reynolds' latest book and get it signed by him. So thanks again, David, and thanks to the audience. Thank you. Thank you.